All right, so today we're going to cover the topic of phenylketonuria. Uh, phenylketonuria is a uh, inborn error of metabolism. Uh, that means that the uh, patient is missing some of the basic enzymes required for metabolizing uh, one of the, you know, either amino acids, uh, carbohydrates, lipids, or uh, DNA. So in, in uh, phenylketonuria, this is related to inborn error of metabolism uh, with regards to the amino acid uh, phenylalanine. And again, this is the most common um, inborn error that, that is around, uh, and it is an autosomal recessive trait. So uh, before, you know, before we can understand uh, how everything works, it's, it's kind of good to just kind of talk about how phenylalanine is degraded by the body. So if you remember, phenylalanine is a uh, benzene ring, uh, which is attached to the you know uh, amino acid group, and uh, with the uh, enzymes uh, phenylalanine hydroxylase, which is also uh, written for short PAH, uh, it gets converted into um, oh, sorry, it gets converted into tyrosine, uh, and Pretty much the difference between phenylalanine and tyrosine is the fact that this has a OH group, hydroxide group uh, right at the edge there. Now, uh, it does require a cofactor. The cofactor is uh, tetrahydrobiopterin, which is uh, written as uh, BH4 for short. So this is a cofactor. It's not a, it's not a protein like the phenylalanine hydroxylase. And uh, this actually does need to be recycled. And there's enzymes you know, for its recycling. Uh, every time it gets used. And so um, the primary pro uh, area where you will have a problem is going to be either with this enzyme here, the phenylalanine hydroxylase, or with the BH4. So both of these have been associated with uh, problems. Now, here's what happens if you have too much. If for some reason you have greater than 20 milligrams per deciliter uh, in the blood, then these will become ketones. Uh, and the, and the, the phenylketones, there's two primary ones, uh, phenylacetate and phenylpyruvate. Uh, and these are your uh, phenylketones. Now, these will then get extruded into the urine. Now, this is not where the problem lies. It's not like, you know, you kind of think of diabetic ketoacidosis, where it's actually the ketones that kind of cause a lot of trouble. In this situation, these ketones are not really causing any problems. It is just the ele it's the uh, phenylalanine in the blood which is causing the problems. But this does serve as a good marker uh, to help uh, understand the severity of the uh, problem there. So um, this is the overall pathogenesis. So let's talk about the three broad categories that phenylketonuria is uh, broken into. So the first one is going to be the classic phenylketonuria. Uh, this is the most common and, and uh, probably going to, it's kind of like, again like it's named, the classical example. The other one is uh, hyperphenylalanemia. So it's kind of tough to say. And then the final one is going to be uh, malignant uh, phenylketonuria, and kind of the name suggests it's pretty, uh, it's going to be the most severe. Uh, so what is the difference between all the three, and how, what are they, di are they differentiated by? Um, with, with classic phenylketonuria, there's going to be uh, greater than 20 milligrams per deciliter of uh, ph uh, phenylalanine in the blood. And so because you have greater than 20 uh, milligrams per deciliter, like we, we described here, you're going to, there's going to be the presence of phenylketones. And this is classically associated with a complete loss of the enzyme phenylalanine uh, hydroxylase. So that's, that's where you tend to get this situation. In hyperphenylalanemia, you have less than 20 milligrams per deciliter of uh, phenylalanine. And so there's nothing in the urine, and all you have is an elevated amount in the blood. But the urine is going to be uh, free of ke uh, phenylketones. So this is going to be a mild degree, and it's usually associated with maybe a smaller degree of 
you know, enzyme deficiency or, or maybe just decreased activity. Finally, with uh, malignant uh, phenylketonuria, this tends to be more resistant to treatment. And this is because the prob problem isn't necessarily with the uh, enzyme. It, the problem is going to be with the uh, tetrahydrobiopterin. Uh, and this, so you're going to have a loss of either producing or the recycling of tetrahydrobiopterin, which is BH4. So either you're not making the BH4 or the recycling process, there's many enzymes here, somewhere in that process you're uh, not able to uh, make it. And so in this situation, you know, um, and, and as we're going to get to in a little bit, tetrahydrobiopterin is used for many other pathways as well. And so you're going to have uh, symptoms that are much more worried. So let's talk about, you know, the clinical presentation of uh, each one. We'll take it one by one. Um, what you'll notice at the initial, so initial, um, what you're probably going to notice is the baby's going to be normal. So at birth, uh, there's not too many signs. They're fairly normal. Uh, however, what will happen is they'll, they'll notice that you'll gradually worsen. So it's a gradual worsening. Uh, and the first, uh, let's just talk about the present, uh, uh, presentation. Uh, you will first present actually the, this vomiting. Uh, the patient will start vomiting and it, sometimes the vomiting is so severe that uh, the, uh, it might seem like pyloric stenosis. Uh, but as they get older uh, and, and as the uh, condition worsens, uh, there's gonna be, you're going to start having uh, CNS is going to be the uh, most prevalent uh, problem. Uh, the first of all, the intel, their IQ is just going to be low, oftentimes by, by 10 points, and that's one, com one whole standard deviation, so it can be very significant. Um, and, and it also tends to have problems with abnormal movements. And these movements can be, you know, obviously it can be seizures, or it can just be like atetosis or purposeful, purposeless movements, or they could be rocking back and forth. And actually, even if you look at an MRI, you might even uh, notice some demyelination uh, that does tend to uh, show up. Uh, also, there is going to be some other findings. Uh, the skin is going to be very light skin. Uh, because if you remember, you know, uh, phenyl, uh, phenylalanine gives you tyrosine. So let's go write this in there. Tyrosine, this is phenylalanine. Uh, tyrosine, which then goes on to make melanin. So uh, they kind of have albinism. Uh, and so not only light skin, but light eyes, and they, uh, they tend to have hair loss. Also, they tend to have uh, a musty smell, uh, a musty smell to them as well. Uh, so I kind of think of it as a sense of lightened, uh, lightened eyes and nose. So uh, you see them as very light skin, and you can also smell them. Um, now, with hyperphilanalanemia, uh, they tend to be uh, asymptomatic. And there's going to be a very progressive brain damage. So you don't get any, some of the other uh, symptoms, such as the light skin, light eyes. Uh, but you do get the brain damage, so they're going to have a low IQ. Uh, and this can kind of fall on the radar unless they do the screening test, which we'll go over in a little bit. Uh, and malignant phenylketonuria, uh, again, the problem is going to be more associated with BH4. Uh, so let's kind of talk about what is BH4 uh, and, and all the things that it does. So BH4 is a cofactor for phenylalanine to be converted to tyro tyrosine. It's also a cofactor for tyrosine to be converted to dopamine and uh, uh, tryptophan to be converted into uh, serotonin and arginine to be converted to nitric, nitric oxide synthase enzyme, so you get incorporated into that enz uh, enzyme. So you can see that the, the, with BH4, the symptoms would be much, much more. And the reason why they call it malignant is because just by inhibiting phenylalanine, it's not going to take care of some of the other problems. So they called it malignant because it was kind of uh, refractory to treatment. Uh, so clinically, uh, what you're going to find uh, is, um, so let's just write that here real quick. So clinical, uh, what you'll find is going to be deterioration even with the dietary changes that we're going to talk about. So you, you change the diet, you restrict uh, the phenylalanine, but they still uh, tend to have these uh, changes. And this is going to be, you know, the CNS findings 
whereas with classic phenylketonuria, if you kind of noticed, it was more movement. Uh, here, there's actually going to be hypotonia, and uh, this is going to be first seen by, you know, the, they can't uh, hold their head up. Also, because if you remember here, uh, dopamine is responsible for many things. First of all, it's responsible for inhibiting prolactin. So you'll actually have an increase in prolactin levels uh, as well. And of course, uh, exopyramidal symptoms, you know, Parkinsonian-like uh, symptoms. So um, what generally is done is if a patient it does have high uh, phenylalanine levels, they will immediately check the uh, BH4 levels. Uh, however, there is other types of diagnostic tests besides just checking the uh, levels. It's called the BH4 loading test. And so uh, what you do here is you uh, give the patient 20 milligrams per kilogram of BH4. And then you, then you measure the phenylalanine level. And if it normalizes uh, within four to eight hours, then it's going to be, it means the problem is with BH4. If it doesn't normalize, then it's uh, probably not the issue. And so the treatment does become a little bit more complex because with uh, regular phenylketonuria, you know, you could just give, uh, you can just restrict phenylalanine, but in this situation, uh, you need to uh, include, uh, you also need to give the patient dopamine uh, and uh, serotonin and all these, you need to take all these into consideration, as well as constantly measuring the prolactin level uh, to prevent, you know, hyperprolactinemia from the uh, lack of dopamine. So now, um, how would you treat this? So let's talk about treatment. So the primary treatment is diet restriction. And actually, um, so first is going to be diet restriction. Uh, there actually are some commercially available products which remove all the phenylalanine. Because again, the problem is with phenylalanine uh, ele elevating. The higher the phenylalanine, that tends to cause more brain damage. So the first thing is going to be diet restriction with phenylalanine. And then you want to give, so you want to decrease phenylalanine. You want to give a tyrosine supplement as well. Uh, however, for one reason or another, it does lead to deficiencies of certain, uh, I guess, uh, elements, uh, iron, zinc, uh, selenium, and some essential uh, amino, a amino acids. So you kind of need to monitor those as well. And um, there is some debate about whether they can stop uh, at adolescence. Sometimes it doesn't seem to affect them. However, other times it does seem to be some damage to the uh, brain again, you know, low IQ. And, you know, they turn adolescents right around high school, so uh, they might try a trial you know, of stopping the diet and then seeing how the grades kind of function. Uh, but if it doesn't work and, and it, it does seem to have damage for the brain, then they need to continue the diet for a really long time. Uh, and there is a problem, you know, maintaining this diet. A lot of times, you know, children are kind of defiant and uh, they don't want to hang on to the diet and then you, you notice a decrease in IQ level after a while. Uh, the other thing that they also need to be aware of is they, they cannot eat the sweetener called aspartame. Aspartame is a sweetener found in soft drinks, uh, some vitamins and even medications. So anything that has this artificial sweetener can't do it. Uh, there is a drug called uh, sapropterin. Uh, what this is, this is the uh, BH4. So tetrahydrobiopterin uh, cofactor. And it does seem to help certain patients but not others and the whole idea seems that if there is some residual phenylalanine hydroxylase activity this will work but if the phenylalanine hydroxylase is pretty much useless then this doesn't tend to work at all so depending on you know how severe the case is this is an option uh, and the other thing that you might want to give especially if they're not able to hang on to the diet really well is you can give the large neutral amino acids uh, these are the amino acids such as uh, arginine, oops, okay, sorry about that. Uh, arginine, methionine, uh, threonine, so, uh, and there's many more. And the, what this helps is because this competes, uh, this tends to compete with phenylalanine for going into the brain. And so, even if the patient isn't maintaining their diet very, very well, they're not being strict with it. Uh, the, the phenylalanine won't, as much of it at least, will not be able to go to the brain and then um, you're going to uh, kind of prevent some of the brain damage. Uh, there is, uh, with pregnancy, so uh, pregnancy, uh, it is also very, very important that 
the mother uh, monitor her phenylalanine intake, and that's because if she doesn't monitor it, uh, there's an increased risk of mental retardation for the child. Uh, you know, it's also associated with uh, microcephaly, um, also with congenital heart disease and intrauterine growth restriction. So it is associated with that. So they need to pretty much do a, maintain a um, phenylalanine free diet so that you know it doesn't affect the baby. Finally, what is the prognosis? So um, what can these patients expect? If it's detected within the first month and properly treated, um, they could actually uh, have a normal IQ. And this is why currently there, you know, all babies that are born in the U.S. and many other countries are, uh, they tested for phen uh, phenylketonuria right away because it is a preventable form of uh, mental retardation. So uh, th this has prevented majority of the case uh, from, um, from uh, getting worse. Now, um, even with treatment though, sometimes even if they are treated, there is a minimal uh, decrease in uh, IQ. Uh, and this is especially if uh, you know, they, they, they get above 360 um, micromoles per liter. So this, this has been shown for that. Um, and actually, there, are, there is some psychological disorders, such as uh, agoraphobia and other phobias and kind of, you know, personality characters, uh, you know, uh, that has been shown with that. And um, also, counseling is very important, uh, especially as these kids grow a little bit older and they kind of have to monitor their own uh, diet. It's very important that they understand um, how, you know, what, why, they sh why they should be watching their diet and, you know, just why it's, so, why it's so important to maintain the diet so that they don't fall back and just, you know, start eating, the, you know, uh, incorrect food and uh, harming themselves. So I hope that was helpful. hope you guys enjoyed. See you later.